Welcome to the video, guys. All glory, honor, and praise to my Father in heaven and to my Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Today I'm going to be talking about love versus fear. What's your motivation? Why do you do the things you do? Is it out of love or is it out of fear? But before I jump into that, guys, just hit the like button and comment down below and subscribe if you are not subscribed. If you are subscribed, hit the bell notification icon. If you've already hit the bell notification icon, make sure it says all notifications and not personalized in the subsection, the drop menu. All right. So I was having a conversation with someone recently and I was telling them that what's your motivation What's the motivation for how you live your life? Do you do things out of love or do you do things out of fear? Because when we do things out of love, we're doing things out of faith, right? And when we're doing things out of fear, we're doing things out of doubt. We're doing things that not in faith, right? And, and these things are going to produce two different results. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? That those, that those who seek God must believe that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek them. The Bible says if you doubt, you shouldn't expect to receive because you're being double-minded. But that when you ask, you must ask in faith and must not doubt and you will receive what you ask for. And so we know that fear is of doubt and love is of God. For the Bible says that God is love, right? I remember before I would tell people how nine times out of ten, something that people fear is something out of their own imagination. It's something that has not happened yet that they're anticipating will happen but they don't know for sure if it will happen. So what they're fearing is literally their own imagination. They're, right? they're obeying the enemy. God says he will provide for you. But if you fear that he won't, that means you believe the voice of the enemy, not the voice of God. Because if God says he will, the Bible says God is not a man that he should lie. So if we know that God's word is bond. If he said it, he meant it, and he's going to do what he said. right? But the opposing voice is what if God doesn't really do it? And that, that's the voice of the enemy. And so who do you have your faith in? Is your faith in the voice of God or is your faith in the voice of the enemy telling you the opposite of what God has for you? And so the, the way this conversation got brought about is because a person that I was talking to, we were talking about the church that they attend and we were discussing whether or not this is a real church of God, if this is really the right place to be. And so we ended up doing some deliverance for some things about the church and she discovered that this wasn't really the this church wasn't teaching as accurately as she once thought. And so after the prayer, after the deliverance and the things that happened, uh, this person wanted to still continue to attend this church. I didn't tell them not to. They wanted to attend it. And, I, and what I was asking is, do you still want to attend this church because you think you should be there? or because you fear what people are gonna say about you if you don't go there. You fear the members may think that you uh, have left the faith or, or that you are a bad person or that, you, that you've went back into sin, right? Are you going to this place out of love to say like, you know what? I wanna go to this place and continue to love these people. I wanna continue to, if they've taught me wrong, I wanna present them with what is right to see if they'll change their hearts and come to the truth. I wanna go there out of love and love them and, and, um, and see if I can win them over to the way of the truth out of love, right? But Or are you going there because you fear looking bad? You fear they're going to talk about you or, say, or, or make comments about you. And, 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 and so is your motivation for attending love or is your motivation for continuing to attend fear, right? We can, th this same analogy or the same example can be present in, in a marriage, right? It's... Do you fear, do you love this person or do you fear not having something good for yourself? Like, do you fear that if this marriage, if you don't have this marriage, that you won't be happy or that nothing else can come along or that this is the best that there is, this is the best that you deserve and this is all that you should have. And so you, you, you want to make sure you behave in a way, not out of love, but out of fear of self-preservation. That's how some people are. It's like they may know a person is not up to the standard that they, that they are hoping for. But what if that person doesn't come? There's the doubt, right? What if the better thing doesn't come? What if this is the best that there is? I know I have this standard. I know, this have, I, know I have this idea. I know I asked God for something specifically. 
but what if that person doesn't come? So I'm going to settle. I'm going to choose this. I'm going to select this person because what if that does not happen? And so they choose a person out of fear and not, they're not literally choosing a person out of love. And so what kind of foundation does that lay? And what kind of fruit does that produce later on? We know that, again, love is of God and fear is of the devil. And so if you're doing things out of fear, then because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So anything you're doing out of fear is going to be producing fruit of the enemy, right? And anything you're doing out of genuine and true love will be producing fruit. The fruit that God wants us to produce for love is the fruit of the spirit. And so that's the question when, when, I, when I, I, I'm just challenging the listener today. When you examine your life, you examine the decisions that you are making, you know, what is the motive? Is it love or fear? I had seen something before that was showing that love and fear are the only two emotions, right? As far as like major, the major emotions, that every other emotion is a branch off of love or fear. Like those are the two parent emotions. There's love, which is of God, and this fear, which, of the, which is of the enemy, right? Which is of the devil, for God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. And all throughout the Bible, I think I seen this meme a while ago that was shown like hundreds of times in the Bible. It tells you, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not fear, for God is with us, God is with you. And so we know that God repeatedly has told us not to be afraid. So any fear, anytime you feel fear, that fear is not of God, unless that's the fear of God, which is the beginning of all wisdom, right? But any fear outside of anything else that is not God, you know that that is not of God, right? So if we, and so, so if we take an emotion like anxiety, right? Anxiety is under the, it's a subheading under fear. Why are you anxious? If we was to make a list of all the reasons that you were anxious, they would all be stems of things that come from fear, right? So anxiety is a fruit of fear, right? What are you sad about, right? Let's say that sadness, not, not all sadness, but oftentimes a lot of sadness is a result of fear. People are depressed because of fear. They fear that their lives won't get better. They fear that there's not light at the end of the tunnel. They fear, they fear that there's not hope out there. They fear that nothing's going to change. They fear that life may not be worth, worth it, right? It, it, and so on the flip side, you have emotions like joy, peace, right? Why do you have peace? Why does a Christian have peace? Why does a believer in Jesus Christ have peace? Of course, we have the Holy Spirit that gives us peace and a sound mind. But also, and with that, we understand the love of God, and when you know the love of God, <clears throat> when you know that God is sovereign, when you know that God sees all and that God hears all, what is there to fear if you are God's child and he's watching over you? Anybody that's a parent out there, you know that you will protect yet you would never let any harm come to your child on your watch. You would always stand in front of them and protect them. Right now, there may be things that you have to allow them to go through so that they can learn for their own growth and development so that as they age and mature and become adults, they can be functional human beings. There may be hardships. There may be trials that they have to endure for the sake of their maturity and their growth. But as far as letting anything destroy them or conquer them, you would never let that happen on your watch if there's something you can do about it. And sometimes I think that we think that we are better parents than God. Sometimes I think that we think that we love our children more than God loves us. And I'm here to let you know that that's impossible, right? For God is love, right? So the greatest of all loves is the love of God, right? And that's why we have the first commandment. The Bible says we love God, but he first loved us. So before we knew what love was, God was already loving us. And that's why we know that our first commandment we've been given is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And so if God, if you love your son or you love your daughter with all your heart, you know that you'd give your life for them if it came down to it, that you would guard them with your life. How much more does God love you? You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a verse in the book of Isaiah that says, and this is probably one of the a modern translation of it, but it says, God will give people in exchange for you and nations in exchange for your life. Like God had given entire nations in exchange for one that he loves, Right? Like when Abraham went and rescued Lot, he loved Lot and he went and rescued him on a, on a, on a whole mission to rescue Lot. And so if you, one of the reasons a Christian has peace, a Christian that knows God has peace is because you know that 
the almighty most high God who is greater than all, who has created all, is looking over you. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean you won't have a challenge or a trial for the sake of your growth, your maturity and your development, right? And your spiritual growth, but that nothing's going to overcome you because God is looking over you and you are his son, you are his daughter. And in that there is peace. There's nothing to fear because your father is greater than all, right? The Lord Jesus Christ is greater than all, right? The Bible says even the demons know that there is one God and they tremble. They tremble in fear of our Lord and our God. They tremble in fear. Right? What happened when Jesus was walking the earth? The demons would shout out and say to Jesus, Jesus, what are you doing here? Have you come to torment us before our time? They were terrified at the sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were terrified. Now, people weren't, the Pharisees weren't terrified. They couldn't see him for who he was, right? But the demons who are from another dimension, from another realm, they were terrified of the Lord. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? So from the toughest to the biggest to the baddest power, human being or, or power beyond human beings that there is, everything in all existence is going to bow, confessing the Lord Jesus Christ to the glory of God our Father. No one's going to be tough. No one's going to be bold. No one's going to, every knee is going to bow at the power, at the glory, at the terror that's coming, you know, at the sight of the Lord. And so I just say that to say, when that's the power that's guarding you, you have peace. And that peace is a product of love. It's because you know that you are loved. You know, sometimes we think that we have to have it all right to be loved. Again, you, do you think that you're a better mother or a better father than God is a father? Right? How many of your children get it, need to get everything right for you to love them? How many of them need to get it? Some people might think, man, I made a mistake, man. I, um, I, I don't know if God's going to provide for me today because I made a mistake. Like, how many of your children have went to bed hungry while you had food because they made a mistake? I'm not talking about living in perpetual willful disobedience to God. That's a whole nother topic. That's, you know, the Bible says those who continue in willful sin, these are not the children of God. I'm talking about those who made a mistake or who have fallen short or haven't been living up to standard. God knows where you at. He see, can see you coming and going from a million miles away. And he loved you then. He's loving you now and is loving you tomorrow. So we know that fear is not of God and we know that love is of God. And in love, there's peace, there's joy, there's power, there's a sound mind, there's gentleness, there's kindness, there's goodness, there's faithfulness, and, and there's self-control, right? Because we are loved, right? And fear, fear produces wrath, strife, violence, Sometimes people result to violence because they're afraid of someone wanting to do violence to them. Sometimes people result to violence and stealing and robbery because they're afraid that they're not going to be able to eat. Or if they don't get this thing that they want, they're not going to be happy. And so the reason for their rage, the reason for their aggression, the reason for is because they're afraid. Right? There are people, even, even we can take it off of like, you know, a physical thing. There are people in ministry. There are people that are hyper aggressive in ministry because they're afraid of being deceived. And so they have to take a super aggressive approach because they're afraid that somebody might deceive them with a false doctrine. It's still fear. Like what's the motive here? And so fear doesn't always look like somebody shaking and trembling in their boots. Sometimes the, the most scary person is the person who appears to be the toughest. I remember growing up in the, in the, you know, in, in the South Bronx and, and um, you know, there's a certain way that you have to carry yourself so that, and I don't want to say you have to, let me, let me make sure I modify that. 
in that worldly mindset because we know you can carry yourself however because God is our protector, right? But when you don't know God, there's a certain way that the environment teaches you to carry yourself because the, what the environment says is if you don't carry yourself with this pride, with this bravado, with this certain level of confidence and esteem about yourself, that people are gonna look at you as a victim. They're gonna look at you as, as, they, as, as they call food, as you're the prey, right? There, there's the wolves and there's the prey and you're afraid to look like prey and so you, you're forced to become a wolf. And so even that is still fear. Some of the toughest people in the world are really afraid. And they've developed this tough exterior to guard themselves, to protect themselves, so that the things that they fear never happen. Because if they had love, if they knew the love of God, if they had faith and trust in the love of God, they could rest and say, you know what? No one can touch me unless God allows it to happen. The Bible says if God doesn't build the house, the builders build it in vain. That if God doesn't watch over the city, those who watch over the city watch it in vain. The Bible says not a sparrow falls to the ground without God. There's not a single bird that dies or falls to the ground apart from the will of God. That means can nothing happen to you apart from the will of God. Now there are people, let me be clear. There's, there's something called justice. The Bible does say God is just. So there are people that are suffering from things that are the result of their own sins and rebellion. I do want to be clear about that. But that's also justice, right? There's a thing called justice. That when we're living in rebellion to get to the will of God, there's this, yes, yeah, sometimes there's justice, right? There's the payment of our sins for the wages of sin is death. The man has been separated from God because of sin, needing reconciliation in Jesus Christ who paid for our sins in his own blood that we might be reconciled unto God. I was just talking to somebody today. I'm probably gonna do a whole video about this is that, you know, Christians are the only religious, quote unquote, I don't really use that word religious, but quote unquote religious group that doesn't participate in animal sacrifices. Muslims do a sacrifice of a goat once a year in the name of the God that they believe in. Hindus do sacrifices still. Buddhists do sacrifices and people that practice Santeria and Voodoo and, and all these other types of witchcraft all do animal sacrifices. They're all shedding blood because of the value of blood in the spirit realm. And so Christians are the only ones who don't do that anymore because we have one final sacrifice once and for all, but the entire world and every spiritual group of people on the earth understands the value of blood. And then so... It, then they, when, when they think about that, they, they understand the power of when, we, when Christians are talking about the blood of Jesus Christ and whose blood was eternal life that paid for the sins of the whole world. Um, but love and fear. What's your motivation? Are you motivated by love or are you motiv motivated by fear? Do you give to those in need because you love them? Or do you give to those in need because you're afraid if you don't give to them, God's not going to bless you? Or you're afraid if you don't give to them, you're going to look like a bad person? Like, what are you motivated by? The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. So we know that when we know the love of God, the love of God casts all fear from us because we understand God's perfect love and that love and fear can occupy the same space because they're opposites like oil and water. Where there, is, where there is love, there's no fear. Where there is fear, there is no love. And so sometimes even in a, a relationship, a marriage, when somebody is afraid of losing somebody, they're not loving the person, they're loving themselves. And they may use the person to love themselves, but they're not actually giving themselves. They're, they're preserving themselves because they don't want to lose this person because then they're going to be left uh, hurt or harmed or without. And so they're not, loving, they're not loving a person. They're loving themselves and using a person to love themselves, but never actually loving the person. Because the motive is wrong. They're afraid that they're not going to have somebody good. They're afraid that they're going to be unhappy or be by themselves. And so as long as they're having those struggles with those fears and worries and concerns, they are never going to actually properly love 
And so these are things I think we all can work on and just examine our lives and see where you're being motivated by love and fear and asking God in the name of Jesus Christ to help you live a life where you're motivated by love, where you're acting and doing things from a position and place of love and not from a position and a place of fear. So that's the video of the day, guys. What is your motivation, love, or fear? Examine your life, examine your choices, and make make sure it's coming from a place of love. And if it's not, ask our Father for help. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, all glory, honor, and praise, and power, all might and majesty to my Father, to our Father in heaven, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you guys for tuning in. My three-hour class, uh, The Sword of the Spirit, Spiritual Warfare, is available. Uh, I just got really good feedback again from class number six, Seeking God with a Pure Heart. If you're interested in any of those classes, you can get them off my website, or you can email me. And I can get them to you that way if you would like to just get them from me directly that way. That's it, guys. Glory, honor, and praise to my Father, to our Father, and to the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Peace and love. Appreciate you guys. Thank you.